Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Binu Santhu. It's the 27th of October 2023 and here are the questions we will be answering today. Why are Chinese companies under scrutiny in India? What can you expect from the Business Standard BFSI Insight Summit? What are markets expecting from Reliance Industries Q2 results? And what is the Rohini Commission on OBC? Chinese companies, it seems, have been under increased scrutiny in India since the 2020 border clashes. Hundreds of apps have been banned, several smartphone makers have been served with tax evasion notices, and telecom firms have been kept out of 5G trials. In our first segment, Ayush Mishra delves into the details to find out why Chinese companies are facing scrutiny in India. Chinese auto major BYD's proposal to invest $1 billion in a car factory in India has not found favor with the government and could be stalled. The proposal was in a joint venture with Hyderabad-based Mega Engineering and Infrastructure Limited, to which BYD provides technology for e-buses. The Income Tax Department is also investigating at least 40 Chinese solar module manufacturers, which includes companies such as Trina Solar Limited and Longi Green Energy Technology. The department is also scrutinizing their Indian distributors for potential tax evasion. Following the border conflict in 2020, the Indian government banned more than 300 Chinese apps. Subsequently, Chinese firms faced increased scrutiny, requiring additional government approval for investments in India. The Indian government has asked Chinese companies like Xiaomi, Oppo, Realme and Vivo to bring in Indian equity partners and appoint Indian executives. Raids were also conducted at the offices of Vivo. The sensitive nature of the telecommunications sector has led to increased scrutiny of Chinese telecom companies. Huawei and ZTE were under scanner for a while before being barred from participating in new technology or 5G network deployments. Sanjay Bhattacharya, former secretary to the Ministry of External Affairs, explains the rationale behind the scrutiny. The main reason for scrutiny is uh, the lack of Chinese uh, introspection in the ways they do business because they try to circumvent the laws of the land and even international rules. Uh, they will naturally come under scrutiny. China has violated all the boundary agreements that were enacted between India and China and therefore is in violation. It is unreasonable to expect that we can have normal uh, economic relations. To safeguard Indian companies from opportunistic takeovers and acquisitions, during the pandemic, the government amended the foreign direct investment policy. It mandated entities from countries sharing a land border with India to invest only through the government-approved route. The policy shift marked the beginning of increased scrutiny of Chinese companies and investments in India. If you look at the uh, challenges that uh, the Indian companies faced in COVID, one was the fear of takeover. Two, uh, you know, as from the government perspective, a lot of individuals in India uh, faced the challenge of inappropriate gaming apps, inappropriate financial apps, uh, which were duping the consumer. The third uh, one was uh, relating to data security of Indian uh, you know, private data as well as data of, uh, you know, what these apps would track. Uh, and therefore, the com combination of these five aspects, right, uh, was what led to the uh, specific notification press note three in terms of investment and the action that was taken in banning particular apps. It started with gaming apps, then other financial service apps and other apps in India. So, how does scrutiny impact various sectors? The particular impact of this uh, will be in some of the renewable energy sectors. Uh, because of Chinese uh, violations, uh, India has stepped up its solar production, for instance. The second 
is in the pharma sector, because while we were hugely reliant on Chinese APIs, uh, we will see many more of these now being produced in the domestic sector. The third area that I think will be critical will be in the growth of our startups, of our innovation sector, because as you know, the Chinese have invested deeply in many of our uh, startups and many of the unicorns have very large Chinese funding. But I suspect that this will go down over a period of time. While Indian authorities have been scrutinizing Chinese investments, there are signs indicating their willingness to consider Chinese capital infusion in specific sectors. The key here is building trust and addressing security concerns. Dilip Chinoy shares his insights on the road ahead in this regard. Each of the sectors and each of the companies is an individual case. He has got their own uh, individual challenges. So the first thing is that the company should, in a transparent manner, agree to and actually demonstrate that they're complying with every Indian law. Second, it should be very clear that they have a transparent ownership structure and it, it does not go to the ownership of the state. The third is they should actually demonstrate that they're carrying out free and fair financial arms length financial transactions and not evading uh, you know, uh, taxes or not uh, doing other things like that. The fourth is they should look at, uh, you know, being transparent in the companies and the ownerships and the institutions they fund. And the fifth is they should try and integrate with Indian, uh, uh, Indian, uh, the whole ecosystem. Chinese companies in India are under scrutiny due to a combination of national security concerns, economic considerations and geopolitical shifts. The scrutiny impacted various sectors, triggering efforts to create a level playing field for domestic industries. Balancing regulation, trust building and adaptability remains crucial as India navigates the complex landscape of global economic and political relations. After China, let us now move on to a much-awaited annual event. The two-day business standard BFSI Insight Summit is starting from the 30th of October. It will feature prominent voices from India's economic, financial and corporate landscape, including RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das, IDAI Chairman Devashish Panda, SEBI Whole Time Member Anant Narayan, Geo Financial Services Chairman KV Kamath, SBI Chairman Dinesh Khara and Fonte CEO Samir Nigam. For an international perspective, the summit will also feature Christopher Wood, the global head of equity strategy at Jefferies. The summit comes at a time when India's digital banking infrastructure is expanding at a very fast pace and its economy is projected to become the third largest in a matter of years. However, challenges are mounting too. Against this backdrop, join A.K. Bhattacharya, Tamal Bandhubadhyay and Ruchika Chitravanshi to find out what to expect from this summit and why you cannot afford to miss it. Business Standard BFSI Summit is about to kick off on October 30th. And if you're interested in banking, finance, and insurance sector, then that is the place to be. To discuss what the summit holds for you and what will be the key highlights, we have with us Mr. Ashok Kumar Bhattacharya, Editorial Director of Business Standard, and our Consulting Editor, Mr. Tamal Bandhupadhyay. Welcome, uh, Tamal. Welcome, AKB, for this discussion. I'd like to start with Tamal. This is the fourth edition of Business Standards BFSI Summit. What were some of the standout moments from the last year's summit? Uh, and of course, AKB, I'd like your view also on the same later. Tamal. Yeah, thanks, Ushika. Uh, you know, I would like to believe it's uh, the fireside chat with which we started uh, with RBI governor. 
In fact, that was the time when the World Cup just got over. And everybody was talking about Messi's goal. And actually, it is a Bank of India governor. You know, it's, it's a great communicator. So whatever question you ask him, he was the Messi. In fact, I did say, and one of the news agencies actually quoted that, that uh, governor is the Messi. So it was, a, um, I would say, in terms of presence and in, in terms of uh, presence of the audience and the intellectual discussion, it was fabulous. But uh, it takes the cake as the governor's uh, uh, with which we started the fireside chat with Governor. Of course. What about you, AKB? What do you think was the most memorable part? I think I think Kamal is absolutely bang on. Uh, I think the RBI Governor is uh, the centerpiece of this entire BFSI summit. Uh, but I would say that I would add to it and 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 say uh, that uh, there are moments uh, of uh, of discovery. Uh, in this entire summit, where you don't get uh, a hard news point, but you get to know what drives what in this hard financial sector of the country. Uh, so you get uh, your own understanding enhanced, and your takeaways are even more rich if you want to uh, understand uh, what is really happening to the Indian financial sector. And that has been my 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 major major discovery. Uh, in the last few years, BFSI summit. Kamal, what will be the uh, key focus areas of discussion in this year's summit? Well, you know, it's it's a very interesting time, uh, interesting quote unquote, because uh, Indian banking system it's a golden era. Uh, Mr. Kamath says, who happens to be the inaugurator for the uh, for this summit this year. He said, this is the best banking time in the last 50 years. So you have, that's the banking system. You have NBFCs when Reserve Bank of India's rule-based regulations, you know, talking about in the high-level NBFCs, upper-level NBFCs to be, to be treated like banks. So there's a dilemma ahead of them. You have uh, mutual fund segment, the markets uh, where, you know, apart from the volatility in the market, you see the AUM of mutual fund is growing every every month. Uh, and so is unique investors. You have uh, small finance banks, you know, uh, many of them have got into market and few of them who are still yet to, they will be also entering the market in the next couple of months. Um, so, and India is poised to become uh, as we speak, uh, to overtake Japan by 2030 um, as the third largest economy. So from every point of view, and everything is happening in the insurance segment. So this is this is a fabulous time to pick the brain of the best in business and finance and banking. And this is a platform for it. All very important points, sir. Uh, one of the interesting chats we are having, AKB, is with uh, Christopher Wood, who is the global head of uh, equity strategies at uh, Jeffries. What are the key insights that you're expecting uh, from this interaction? You're absolutely right, uh, Ruchika. Uh, Christopher is, a, if I may use that expression, is an eternal optimist, particularly about Indian markets. And this uh, BFSI summit uh, is taking place at a time when markets are in turmoil. Uh, it is not just a question of uh, uh, the global headwinds, but it is also a question of uh, what kind of uh, business opportunities or earnings uh, prospects uh, lie ahead of Indian investors. And I would uh, really look forward uh, to listening to Christopher Wood's views on the Indian markets and how the Indian markets can withstand uh, the, the pressures of the phenomenon called uh, the world is on fire or the world is in flux. So what kind of takeaways the Indian investors should uh, should uh, should uh, should believe in uh, that uh, question will probably be answered in Christopher Wood's session. And as AKB pointed out uh, earlier, that uh, the RBI governor was the centerpiece of this event. This year again, we have the privilege of having uh, RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das with us. Uh, can you set the context uh, for us, Tamal, in which Shakti Kanta Das will be having a chat uh, with uh, with us in this summit? Uh, well, incidentally, this is his fourth appearance, fourth appearance for uh, RBI governor. 
uh, but the context is you know it's it's different because while india is a sort of oasis india is the engine of growth for the, the, the in the global context but you see the global headwinds uh, are very different now uh, the geopolitics uh, the interest rate what's happening in us the spread the shrinkage of spread between us paper and us government paper and indian paper the inflation where there where while we have been able to uh, you know i would not say tackle or bottle the inflation jelly but somehow we are ahead of the fight against inflation probably we are also ahead in terms of ending the um, higher interest cycle there's no more high probably uh, while the things are very uncertain overseas and it's a global world i mean you can't say that we are decoupled we need to see that so in this context what governor says on these issues apart from what's happening in the cryptocurrency and cbdc and technology but this macro issues are very very important i think everybody will be eagerly watching and waiting for for to, to hear him we all would be uh, listening very keenly to the rbi governor finally akb uh, we have a range of subjects that we are discussing uh, in this summit what are some of the topics that you are most looking forward to well uh, i am looking forward to the session on digital payments uh, remember uh, one of the many bright spots of the indian economy is about the, the about the digital payment infrastructure and what kind of opportunities and what kind of services that are now possible uh, for consumers of of the finance uh, now the digital payment infrastructure is uh, going to be x-rayed so to say uh, at this session there is also a very interesting session on what kind of challenges uh, the financial technology sector faces through the use of clouds and the data center growth and last but not the least uh, is a, a session uh, with uh, the sebi's uh, the market regulator securities and exchange board of india's whole time member uh, mr uh, anant narayan uh, who is going uh, to shed more light on uh, what the market regulator uh, is uh, going to do about uh, the the market dynamics the market developments and the market prospects all very important uh, points there in kb i'm sure it's going to be a very rich discussion uh, as you said it so nicely that uh, we of course as news people look for headlines but there are moments of discovery that happen and i'm sure it will be a very enriching experience for all of us and as tamal has uh, also explained that the summit is happening in the backdrop of a very rich domestic and uh, global context thank you so much uh, uh, tamal and akb for uh, all your insights into the summit for this curtain raiser that you have given us thank you so much thank you one of the challenges that the experts just spoke about was global uncertainty it is singeing indian equity markets too key indices have been in a free fall over the past couple of days with the bsc sensex index crashing 900 points on thursday and the nifty 50 index nearing the 18850 mark the markets are at their lowest levels in 4 months with them the shares of india's most valuable company reliance industries too have lost ground as they dropped 4% in 5 days analysts believe volatility in the commodity market coupled with heavy capex plans have been weighing on the stock so will the company's september quarter results help it come out of its slumber or will it trigger another round of sell off what are the markets expecting from rils q2 results let's find out in our next report Shares of India's most valuable company, Reliance Industries, have underperformed on the bourses so far this calendar year. The stock of Mukesh Ambani-led company has slipped 5% thus far in 2023, as against nearly 4% rally in the BSC Sensex Index. The BSC Oil and Gas Index, meanwhile, has plunged 12.5% during the period. This underperformance comes amid volatile oil markets and heavy capex expansion by the company. Though the company remains a compelling long-term investment bet, analysts say the immediate trigger for the stock remains its September quarter results, which will be announced after market hours on October 27. According to Mayuresh Joshi of William O'Neill India, the robust performance of Reliance Retail may stand out the most during the quarter. So, if you look at Reliance Retail's operations, which are now spread across uh, a large part of the country. 
and the expectations in terms of the reasonable amount of growth expected to come through even in the next few quarters as festivities begin and the margins probably holding up uh, means that the core retail business uh, that reliance probably runs through should be relatively stable when you are talking about telecom numbers uh, and it comes to geo financials per se i think the arpu increases that we have seen uh, uh, have been a positive surprise and they might continue into the next few quarters he however expects the oil to chemical segments earnings to be volatile when it comes to the oil and gas space uh, obviously the expectation is with the kind of volatility that we are seeing in both brent crude and gas prices uh, it should be somewhere uh, that reliance should benefit largely because the grms that they probably produce because of the different feedstock options that they've got is relatively better than most players in the market and therefore this part of the segment uh, because of better usage and availability of feedstock should be relatively better to the other players but i think volatility in numbers might continue because of macros as well as the pricing mechanism and environment that is existing on a consolidated basis a bloomberg poll expects revenue to fall 11.4% year on year to 2.24 trillion rupees while adjusted net profit could grow 16% to 17961 crore rupees according to analysts at gm financial RIL's consolidated EBITDA will likely grow 5% QOQ to 39,900 crore rupees, aided by strong growth refining margins, offsetting weakness in pet care margins, strong growth in gas output, and steady growth in digital and retail business. Joshi said, impact of supply chain constraint, higher logistics cost, pass through of rise in input costs. quantum of arpu growth and road map for new energy and geo financial services will be key monitorables on the bourses the stock of reliance industries settled at 2226 rupees a piece on october 26 as per technical charts the near term buyers will likely remain bearish as long as it trades below 2250 mark moreover The stock may retest its March low of 2180 rupees on the downside. On 27th October, apart from Reliance Industries, Sipla, Dr Reddy's Lab, Indian Hotels, Maruti Suzuki and SBI Life are among the prominent companies scheduled to announce their Q2 results. Besides, global developments will also sway market mood. He's making plans. for an early retirement business standard after markets let us find out what's going on on the domestic front it seems that the caste survey in bihar has changed the course of the country's election narrative some believe that the ruling bjp could implement the rohini commission report to turn the tables on the opposition but what is this commission Basuta Mukherjee explains. Constituted on October 2, 2017, the Rohini Commission was chaired by retired Delhi High Court Chief Justice G. Rohini. The four-member commission was formed to ensure a more equitable distribution of reservation benefits among the other backward classes or OBCs in India. The committee had submitted its report to President Draupadi Murmu on July 21, 2023. The panel was assigned to look into the conditions of socially and educationally backward classes and propose steps for their improvement. It had to examine the extent to which there was an inequality in the distribution of benefits within reservations and work out criteria and parameters by which subcategorization within OBCs can be made. It was also tasked to recommend corrections in regard to central list of OBCs. India's reservation system allocates 27% of jobs and educational seats for OBCs in accordance with the Mandal Commission report. However, concerns rose due to the disproportionate distribution of these benefits among various OBC communities. To address this issue, the Bharatiya Janata Party led National Democratic Alliance government proposed subcategorization in 2017. The Rohini Commission was established to fulfill this objective. 
the commission analyzed more than 130,000 government jobs and admission to government educational institutes that had the OBC quota. The commission found that 97% of the reserved jobs and seats have gone to 25% of OBC subcasts, and only 10 OBC communities have taken the 25% of reserved central jobs and institutional seats. As many as 983, or 37%, of the 2,600 communities under the OBC category had zero representation in jobs and institutes, and only 2.68% reservation had been used by 994 castes. The subcategorization of OBC has already been implemented in 11 states across India. This includes West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Karnataka, Jharkhand, Bihar, the Jammu and Kashmir region, Haryana, and the Union Territory of Puducherry. Trusted Bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. The Rohini Commission was given 13 extensions to complete its report. Well, that's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log into our website, business-standard.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.